the first time I saw gorillas, I was about 150 feet away from them. She was a dedicated and determined researcher, living among the mountain gorillas in a remote rainforest of Rwanda. He was a photographer, hired by National Geographic to film her work. Together, they made history. Nobody thought that they would ever see a human being right in amongst the gorillas like this. Bob Campbell spent nearly three years with Diane Fossey and the mountain gorillas. He shot more than 70,000 feet of film. Much of it has never been seen. I've never been allowed to forget what happened up there because there's always constant interest in what happened with Diane Fossey, what happens with the gorillas even now. Now, for the first time, here is the remarkable story behind the story. A story of passion and pain that brought human and ape closer than ever before for a brief moment in time. Here's a scene that to this day never fails to move and amaze us. A woman and a wild gorilla in intimate contact, immortalized forever on film. He was very curious and always very anxious to come forward and investigate things like uh, the cameras, thermoses, notebooks, or gloves. That woman, American researcher Diane Fossey and her beloved gorilla Digit, thrust the plight of mountain gorillas into focus around the world. What began for Diane as a research project to study gorilla behavior became a passionate crusade to save these noble creatures. A crusade that ended in violence and murder. People all over the world now know about Diane Fossey and her remarkable work with the mountain gorillas of Central Africa. In a land of beauty and danger, this is as close to God as you get. She risked her life. The movie Gorillas in the Mist painted a complex portrait of Diane. Are you responsible for kidnapping this animal? Bill of sale, madam. And turned her into a legend. But little is known about the man who spent nearly three years with Diane, capturing her early work and forging an unusual bond. The time I spent in the Virunga Mountains with Diane Fossey did in fact turn out to be the pinnacle of my career in many ways. It was an extraordinary experience. Although more than 30 years have passed since his time with the gorillas, his memories are still fresh. Each time I revisit them, of course, I pick out an incident and I can remember, because of the visual image, very strongly what went on. Especially that first day when Bob arrived at Diane's Karasuki Research Camp, high in the Rwandan rainforest. She was curious to see, of course, who was coming to look after her camp, and I was curious to see what sort of lady was prepared to isolate herself in these distant mountains. It was September 1968. Bob was hired at the last minute by National Geographic to replace another wildlife filmmaker who'd been seriously injured by a venomous snake bite.
Diane was leaving for two months and needed someone to care for her camp and to film guerrilla behavior. She came out to meet me and I saw this tall, rather elegant figure. She was pretty dirty at that stage. She'd been out to see the gorillas and her boots were muddy and her clothes were wet, but I was quite impressed. To most of the scientific community, Diane seemed an odd choice to study gorilla behavior in the wild. She grew up in California, the only child of a socialite mother and a wealthy stepfather. Although she wanted to be a veterinarian, she didn't pass the science exams, so instead she became an occupational therapist in rural Kentucky. Diane had always dreamed of going to Africa, and in 1963, she finally borrowed enough money to make the trip alone. There, she met the famed paleoanthropologist, Dr. Louis Leakey, and using her formidable charm, immediately impressed him. When Dr. Leakey needed to hire someone for a long-term study of the gorillas, Diane jumped at the chance. By exaggerating her credentials, she ultimately won the job. Just like all of us, Leakey probably um, thought, okay, this person really wants to do this, and that's one of the best criteria for um, success. If someone really wants to do it and they're gonna be facing great hardship, they might succeed. In 1967, Diane set up base in the Congo but within months, civil war forced her to relocate to Rwanda. I decided to establish my study camp at the altitude of 10,000 feet, as far away from human encroachment as I could get it, and yet close enough to one of the mountains on which I found a substantial number of gorillas. Another of Dr. Leakey's protégés, Jane Goodall, was working at the same time with chimpanzees in Tanzania. Louis Leakey felt that women made better observers. He felt that women were more patient, more observant. I think I agree in a certain way that, you know, through evolution, women have had to be patient to be good mothers. And also, women have had to be very much attuned to the wants, the needs, the behavior of non-verbal creatures. Diane was eager to show Bob the gorillas, but their first contact wasn't quite what he hoped. The foliage was so thick, I couldn't see anything. I was waiting to see my first gorilla, and they didn't appear. They were hidden behind the thick foliage. And although I caught a few glimpses, it was a rather disappointing, although exciting, encounter. And I remember thinking, you know, let's move, let's see them, let's go forward a bit. But Diane wouldn't let Bob get any closer. She made it very clear that she didn't want her gorillas that she had partially habituated to be disturbed in any way, to be harassed or stressed. So she insisted I should follow her normal technique, which was to make contact, to set up in a peripheral position, and to let the gorillas dictate the outcome of the contact. She said, I don't want you to disturb my gorillas. I don't want to come back to a bunch of screwed up gorillas, which is literally how she put it. In some of it. Although Bob was an experienced photographer, this was his first assignment as a wildlife filmmaker. But he'd spent his whole life preparing for such a challenge. Bob grew up in Kenya, the youngest of two sons. His English parents moved to Africa after the First World War to farm in the faraway British colony. As a child, he suffered from chronic illnesses, including bouts of malaria that left him weak and bedridden. I was always about a year behind everyone else, and I was something of a loner because of that. So later on in life, when I became a filmmaker, it was very easy to spend 
all of my time on my own with no companions. I was quite satisfied with that. After a stint in the army and as a mechanic, Bob met Heather Martin, a veterinary surgeon, and fell in love. Heather knew the Leakeys, and through them, Bob became friends with their son, Richard. His early assignments documented Richard's archeological digs in search of the origins of man. I think I had something to do with suggesting his name as somebody who could probably work very well with the gorillas. Um, I didn't know Diane at the time, but it seemed to me that what I had known of Bob, both at Nature and subsequently, that he'd be an ideal person, patient, careful, sensitive, and that's what we seemed to need. When Diane returned in November, Bob left without much to show for his effort and no expectation of ever coming back. But Louis Leakey had other ideas. He suggested there must be a long-term photographic study of Diane in the same way as is happening with Jane Goodall. Her husband, Hugo van Laak, was shooting marvelous film of the chimpanzee simply because there was plenty of time and plenty of opportunity. He wanted to see the same happen with Diane. Despite knowing how demanding it would be, Bob eagerly took the assignment. And this was a superb opportunity to return to animals that I really liked to watch and hoped I could do something with. So I accepted quite quickly. His wife, Heather, thought it was a good idea too. Bob and I were both pleased because we were building a house and needed some more money and we didn't realize at that time it was going to be such a heavy, shall we say, um, period in our lives. In April 1969, Bob made the arduous two-day trek back to Rwanda. When I returned to the camp, I knew that Diane was coping with two orphaned gorillas. These two had been captured purposely by the Rwandese National Park Guards on the request of the Cologne Zoo in Germany. Diane had convinced the Rwandans to let her care for the orphans before they went away. She hoped to keep them in Rwanda and one day return them to the wild. She sent out frantic letters seeking international support for her cause. Diane named the two gorillas Coco and Pucker. And over the next few weeks, when weather permitted, she took them for long walks. So I took advantage of that situation to take Simeon still film of what was going on, and that was a good record. This never-before-seen footage reveals Diane's growing attachment to the young gorillas. I was really pleased that I could get so close to two young juvenile gorillas and to actually touch and feel them and listen to their vocalizations. And she was receiving excellent information from their vocal sounds and the way they related to each other and to her. But the most surprising moments are with Diane's dog, Cindy. Instead of being frightened, the two young gorillas took great delight in their newfound friend. It was a little strange to see these gorillas 
playing with Cindy, and Cindy was desperate to play with them all the time. She had to be backed off quite frequently because she was a bit rough. But the gorillas were rough too. It's one of the few times that such a rare relationship has been caught on film. They enjoyed their play, you could see it. And as soon as Cindy jumped up, they would pat Cindy and grab hold of her, and obviously totally unafraid. Despite Diane's repeated efforts to keep Coco and Pucker from a life in captivity, the Rwandan authorities would not relent. Diane was terribly unhappy the day those gorillas left. Once they were put in the cage, she disappeared in actual fact in tears. She just couldn't handle it. Coco and Pucker died nine years later. I have no idea what they died of. To this day, no mountain gorilla has ever survived in captivity. were shipped out. Field work started almost immediately. Diane wanted to get away from the trauma of seeing them go. She was unhappy that having to work with a total stranger. And I began to realize that I wasn't going to get the photographs in the cine film that I wanted. It was a very difficult period. After long days in the cold, damp forest, Bob's living conditions provided little relief. While Diane had a nice cabin, he wasn't so lucky. His conditions when he first went up there were very bad. He had a tent, he was wet, muddy, and Diane put his tent quite a long way from her and the staff. And that's when I discovered that living at 10,000 feet above sea level can be very cold. And inside a tent with only a few blankets, you can be quite uncomfortable. Diane didn't make it easy on Bob. Each day began at the crack of dawn with a single-minded pursuit of recording something unique on film. So a full day would be first have your breakfast, get ready, pack up your cameras, and then set out to find where the gorillas had been the previous day. Then one day, after weeks with little to show for all his work, Bob finally got the break he was looking for. We came across some gorillas that I realized were going to come out of this deep foliage onto a fallen tree. So I urged her forward. And this was the first good picture I got of Diane with her subjects in front of her, both in the same frame. That hard-won effort paid off in more ways than one. Weeks of tension between Bob and Diane were finally easing. Now that we were working on a more friendly basis, I began to realize what Diane was up against. Here she was in an extremely difficult situation with difficult subjects that didn't really want to be approached closely. And I slowly became aware of her physical problems. Uh, climbing that mountain daily was quite a physical stress for her. Diane had so much to cope with that I never did. She had to cope with the, the extreme cold and the metal. She had to wear all these layers of clothes. She had to cope with poachers 
And I didn't have to cope with any of that. And I thought to myself, well, I'm glad that I'm doing the chimpanzees and she got to do the gorillas. Diane may have thought she was working in lonely isolation with little recognition, but all that would soon change. Bob's photos were causing a stir at National Geographic, and in October 1969, he and Diane got some surprising news. And the decision that was made to put her on the cover was what amazed both of us, and we were so pleased about that. This was one time when Diane thought, it's okay, this guy I'm working with now is doing what I want. We're both getting on with the job, and it's working out well. When the January 1970 edition of the National Geographic magazine debuted, Diane became an instant celebrity around the world. I remember it very vividly, uh, seeing the National Geographic article because I had young children at the time and had recently arrived in America. And I looked at this incredibly courageous American woman living literally with the apes, and it was captured so vividly on film that you felt as though someone was doing something to help. For Diane, it was the validation she'd always craved, a moment of triumph that only heightened her commitment to the mountain gorillas. It gave her extra energy for her work, in actual fact. Here she was in difficult circumstances, beginning to do well, and uh, what she was doing had already been exposed in this article. She loved it, and it gave her a real boost. But her newfound celebrity wasn't all she cared about. She wanted more. In some... As time went on, Diane began to realize that I was being more of an assistant to her than just a simple uh, photographic companion. And I was indeed, because I had fluent Swahili and could talk to all the men. I was helping her out in all sorts of difficulties. Their close collaboration and deepening friendship turned into something more. I was, in fact, becoming quite fond of her because she'd shown a whole new side to her character. She'd become more feminine, there was no more aggression, and we were getting along very well. Diane came to my tent one night, quite out of the blue. It took me totally by surprise. She tried to kiss me, and I said, what are you doing? And uh, she reacted rather unhappily to what I'd done, and she took off in a huff. It was a confusing situation. I didn't know whether I was being mercenary and trying to develop relations with Diane so that she'd be nice and comfortable with me, or whether I actually was beginning to have some feelings for her. Eventually, they became lovers. But although Bob was getting close to Diane, he still was not getting close enough to the gorillas. As the time went by and the months passed, I was getting worried, in fact, that I could get anywhere near the beautiful coverage that Hugo van Lauer had made with Jane Goodall amongst the chimpanzees, and I wanted to match this. For me, it was not satisfactory just to watch what was going on. I needed to show the full range of their behavior. So how did Bob and Diane finally manage to get so close to the gorillas? By using some surprising techniques, they caught some remarkable scenes on camera.
Einstein would be sitting in front of me, I would have a limited view, but some of these gorillas would come towards her out of curiosity. And depending what she was doing, she would offer them her notebook or a pencil. And on one occasion, uh, she had some chocolate, for instance, and she offered that. Of course, it, it made no difference. They still just looked. But then one day she put out a mirror. Now they saw a f reflection, or at least one of them did, and came forward. And then we had this wonderful sequence of a gorilla looking at its reflection, not knowing what it was. They could see their image in the mirror and probably immediately thought that this was another gorilla. But why was it moving and where was it? Scenes like this may seem a little shocking today because modern researchers like Dieter Steckless know better. Tempting gorillas with chocolate or mirrors or other novel objects for its time was perfectly understandable. Today, the attitude is that certainly you want to steer away from provisioning. In other words, the idea is that you don't want to do anything that somehow distorts their natural behavior. And of course, provisioning can do that. We, we, we now know that. Diane and I were both creating our own methods as we went along. Neither of us had degrees, and maybe we can be criticized for doing things not the way it would be done today. I happen to think that we hit on an approach which has done as much for helping people to understand the true nature of the great apes and therefore other animals as anything else. But for Bob, after nearly two years of field work, he was desperate to capture undisturbed natural gorilla behavior. And I said, look, something's got to change. We've got to change our habituation technique. We've got to get these animals used to us going towards them and getting in amongst them. So I decided the best thing was to behave like them, to do something that wouldn't worry them. So I just took to all fours. I began to approach them purposely on hands and knees. And strangely, they accepted this quite quickly. The my low profile, uh, submissive attitude, obviously didn't worry them at all. And it was here immediately that we began to realize these gorillas are not so worried about us. They are beginning to trust us. Bob returned to the Virungas after a long break in mid-March 1971. It proved to be the most exciting period of his work. As I got closer to the gorillas, I began to pick up all sorts of little bits of behavior that I hadn't seen before. Now, one of them quite took me by surprise. I saw two of them bending down, and at first I didn't understand what was happening. And then I suddenly realized they were drinking. Now, this was very unusual because gorillas seldom drink. They get plenty of fluid from their succulent foliage. But here was another first. I had managed to get gorillas drinking. And I remember a young female called Papoose tumbling towards me and then stopping and I zoomed in on, on her face and I realized that she was looking at her reflection in the lens and I think I zoomed in on her eyes, those beautiful calm brown eyes. While Bob was making huge strides in his contact with the gorillas, a far more sinister human contact was endangering their very existence. Poaching was on the rise in Volcanoes National Park. At the end of July 1971, Bob photographed this chilling scene of a silverback's mutilated body. 
Diane's reaction to the poachers was very strong. She was a person who felt sympathy for all animals. And so she had harsh feelings about the poachers, not understanding that that was a way of life in Africa. Capturing animals for food was something these poachers always did and continued to do. Diane's emotions ran so deep, she began taking revenge, preying on the Rwandans' fears and superstitions. I especially remember when she was putting on Halloween masks and rushing out and scaring poachers and chasing them. I, I would not have the courage to do that. I wouldn't want to do it, but I wouldn't have the courage to do it either. Diane's rage against the poachers sprang from the close kinship she felt with the gorillas. They had become family to her, each with its own name and distinct personality. As Bob continued his groundbreaking work, he grew close to them too. There were one or two that I actually helped to name, and one of them was called Digit. He was the one with a damaged finger, and I'd reported to Diane, we have this gorilla with a damaged digit. And after referring to this animal several times in that way, we decided this should be his name. And he was a peripheral blackback at that stage, rather shy, always out of sight. But later on, he began to change. He lost some of his peers that he used to play with, and he was searching for a playmate towards the end. September 25th, 1971. What began as a routine day changed dramatically when Bob encountered Digit. As I was setting up my camera, he started to come towards me. Now, I didn't quite know at that time what he was doing, but I was filming. And he came forward and he put out his hand and he picked up one of my gloves that I discarded in front of the tripod. Then he moved back and he lifted it up and smelt it. This was the first time I'd got a true contact between him and me. I felt very elated when that occurred. I knew that this creature in front of me was becoming sort of a friend, a distant friend, but one who trusted me and I could trust him. When I first went there, I never had any idea whatsoever that I was going to get close to a gorilla, let alone touch one, let alone have one come up and play with me, or be able to put my head right next to his. <laughs> it was extraordinary. Bob knew he was capturing something unique, but he needed one more element. Eventually, I knew no matter how successful I was being, Diane had to be put in the picture at some stage, and she had to be convinced that this crawling in amongst the animals had to be done by her as well. And I remember one occasion where I asked her to move slowly forward, and one of the gorillas came towards her and actually came up to her glove that she purposely put out in front. So their curiosity was allowing them to come forward with no fear. Once she just followed me through a few of the contacts I was making in that crawling technique, and she could see that they relaxed very quickly, her turnover was almost immediate. Bob had finally won Diane over. Their romance and their professional collaboration reached new heights. But little did they know it wouldn't last for long. After months of filming in the rainforest, Bob was ready for a well-earned vacation. 
so he returned home to his wife in Nairobi. I went on this break for Christmas, not knowing that uh, some of my mail had come up to Diane and she'd actually opened one. It was a letter from Richard Leakey asking Bob to join him on an upcoming expedition, one that would take him away from Diane. I hadn't made any firm decisions at that stage. So when I returned in 1972, there was a, a tension. I couldn't find out what it was for a while until Diane let on that she knew. She was very upset by it. She didn't want me to leave the guerrilla filming at this critical period because she still wanted to be shown actually within the guerrilla groups in the same way as Jane Goodall was being seen in amongst the chimpanzees. She was so upset that she set an ultimatum. She said, if you go back and break your guerrilla work, I'm sorry, but you can't come back again. I, it was really a threat trying to make me make a decision that I didn't want to make. She wanted me to stay, and she knew very well that I had a wife and home and a different life back in Kenya, and that I would have to make a very firm decision if I was going to stay with her as a partner to continue her research work. In In their remaining days, Bob and Diane enjoyed unprecedented contact with the gorillas, filming some of the most riveting scenes, including the one that would immortalize Diane and her beloved Digit. Digit went down and prepared a little day nest. I asked Diane if she would slowly go forward towards him. And then he just put out his hand and took her notebook. Then he took her pencil, replaced the notebook. I couldn't believe it. It was as though she was reacting with another human being. I knew as that was going into the camera that this was a scene that would remain forever in the record as the first reach out, a human reaching towards a wild gorilla and being accepted as a normal companion. And I just didn't believe that this was going to be the last scene I would take of her in contact with her gorillas. Bob took the assignment with Richard Leakey and left the Virungas. What went on in those misty mountains over the next five years is shrouded in controversy. Diane's one-woman war against the poachers escalated. Then, in 1977, the unthinkable happened. Digit, the shy, gentle gorilla who had captivated the world, was killed by poachers. His head and hands cut off. Bob got the news in a telegram sent directly from Diane. I was absolutely shattered because I knew this was a gorilla she loved, and it's one that I was so fond of as, a, as an animal, unbelievably close to him. So I was almost as shattered as Diane was when I heard this. Bob would never understand the reason for Digit's death. I don't know why Digit was killed. I feel in my own mind that this was somebody getting back at Diane. He saw Diane once more, just briefly, over the next 10 years. One evening, Diane rang me up. I was taken by surprise, and she said, I've got to see you. And I think she was hoping to open the way to another period, because she was 
She was very nice. She listened to what I had to say, and she told me about her problems and what was going on there. I think she desperately wanted to continue, even in the way that we had before, which wasn't very satisfactory for her. But that was the last time I saw her, and in the end, we all know, I never went back. By 1985, Diane found herself increasingly isolated and lonely. Because of her anti-poaching tactics, the Rwandan government threatened to shut down her research study. Then, on December 26th, late at night, an unknown intruder entered Diane's cabin and attacked her with a machete. Her body was found the next morning. When Diane was murdered, I think I heard it over the radio, and I remember feeling a sort of cold sensation. And all sorts of images went through my mind. And even today, it's a mystery. Nobody knows who committed the murder. We all have our ideas. Diane was buried at her Karasoki camp. A gravestone marks the spot. This unlikely American researcher had spent nearly 18 years living among the gorillas. Diane's death heightened awareness and brought immediate action to save the mountain gorillas a species many predicted wouldn't survive to see the 21st century. Over the years, her legend grew and her legacy remained strong. I think the legacy of Diane Fossey was in the early years uncredited in some ways. She really did some very good science and her journals from Karasoki show that. She had very meticulous gorilla ranging maps, painstakingly hand-drawn, behavior noted on an hourly basis. She was doing very good science. And I think, in some ways, the popularity of the film Gorillas in the Mist, which, after all, culminated in her death, has allowed us to forget that she really did good science. The work that Diane began continues to this day. It is now the longest running research project on mountain gorillas in existence. Before she died, Diane wrote a book about her time in the Virungas. And Bob's role in helping to habituate the gorillas was all but forgotten. Diane Fossey would not give him the credit. She wouldn't let him publish anything or sell any pictures or do anything till she had finished her book, which was 12 years later. She did, in fact, deliver the final snub in that she didn't mention me at all in her book as far as the research work went. She actually cut me out and said I was pretty good at mending the lamps, but didn't, didn't say anything else. That was because she was pretty upset that I had left. Bob Campbell's got no credit at all for what he did for gorillas, and it's absolutely clear. And I think it's um, a great shame because, well, the footage that, that uh, he shot and the work that he did over many years clearly was as important as anything else that's been done in bringing this incredible species to the attention of all of us. Over the years, other filmmakers using advanced cameras brought gorilla images to a wide public audience. while Bob's footage was mislabeled and left untouched in the National Geographic storage vaults, until now.
For Bob, the guerrilla assignment was the highlight of his career, a moment in time that stands above all others. It's now over 30 years since I worked on that project with the mountain guerrillas, but my memories of that period are really vivid. In fact, I've never been allowed to forget what happened there. People are fascinated even now. Today, more than 650 mountain guerrillas survive in Central Africa because of dedicated conservation policies and constant vigilance. Without Bob Campbell and Diane Fossey, the fate of the mountain gorilla might be very different. Bob Campbell was a pioneer in the work that he did in filming the mountain gorillas. I think without this work, much of the Western world would not have had the appreciation of Africa's wildlife that it does today. Much of the underpinning of conservation wouldn't have been developed. Looking back over my career in wildlife filming, I'm not sure what my legacy is. I hope I've brought to people images of wild animals that share this planet with us. And I hope that people have come to realize that we need to take care of them as well as humanity. And if that is a good legacy, then I have succeeded.